Love is, God is love. Love is one of the four candles of Advent, one of the four Sundays of Advent. But today's theme is hope, uh, that we have true hope because uh, our God loves us and came into the world and is coming again. So that's one of the focus uh, points of Advent. Uh, today we're going, or this whole series, uh, we're going to focus on the, one of the Sunday's themes, which is joy. The pink candle is the candle of joy. Uh, and so all of our messages are going to be from Isaiah this Advent season and focusing on the joy of the Lord. So welcome to our, our Advent series. Uh, and um, yeah, it, it's going to be joyful to think about the entrance of the Messiah King, who is the Son of God Eternal, coming into human history. And we're, we're celebrating that. And all of our message is going to be based on the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah lived about 700 years or so before, uh, before the Son of God was born into the world as Jesus. Now, uh, 700 years is a long time, right? Uh, 700 years is a long time for a a piece of writing to survive, okay? Our, our constitution isn't anywhere near that old, right? Uh, but 700 years uh, from when Isaiah fo- first spoke these prophecies and then they were written down and they were passed down and, and uh, the people of, of Israel, the Jewish people, heard them and believed them over the years and decades and centuries, right? And, and many writings don't survive that long, right? And, and I'm just talking about the time between Isaiah and Jesus, but and then... Then there was, there's been 2,000 years after that to, to our time, right? So I, I doubt my s- sermons are going to survive t- 2,700 years. But Isaiah's sermons filled with the Holy Spirit, his writings survived and were passed down. And, and so when we come to uh, the scriptures in, in Isaiah, or any of the scriptures really, but we're coming to these scriptures, we're entering into history. And, but a special kind of history, a a spirit-filled, God's spirit entering into these lessons and these messages and these, these messages of what is to come, right? Of God's future joyful plans that he has for humanity. So it's, it's really easy to tune out on scriptures and not appreciate what we're hearing or, or how big a deal it is. But this, I'm just trying to say, is a really big deal, right? This is bigger than the Seahawks game today. Now, some people don't believe that. That's why they're home, right? Um, or they're online and they're watching both at the same time. Shame on you, folks. Okay. Uh, so this is a huge, huge deal. Because this is about God saying, I know there is darkness and brokenness in the world, but I have been long planning to bring my light into the world. I want to bring my joy, the joy that God has experienced in all eternity. He's saying, I want to bring it into your, your world. You think about that. We, we talked about it in our Hebrew series that, that joy is at the very base root of who God is. It's not a made-up thing. It, it's, it's, it's in the very character of the divine community that we call the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are a loving community that exists in joyful relationship. And they have forever and ever and always will. And, and out of the overflow of just the love and goodness of God, God wanted us to experience life and Part of experiencing life and existence is to experience what's at the heart of God, and that is joy, right? And so God wants us to experience joy. That's why God made us in his image. You are made in the image of the eternal God, right? And so the Advent story is about God saying, I am going to come to earth to right what is wrong so that people can experience my joy eternally and internally forever and within. And so we're going to hear of God's joyous plan to bring his light into the darkness. So may we hear his word today with faith and expectation. So let me pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and all the meditations of all of our hearts, Lord, may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you are truly our rock and our redeemer, our author and our perfecter. You alone should we rightly fear. You alone should we fully follow. You alone should our lives be founded upon. And and you have the joy that every human heart really needs. The hope that every human heart really longs for. The love that, that, that nothing else can satisfy us like your love, God. 
and the peace that you alone can bring. So Lord, may we have ears to hear your, your, your ancient promises that are as live today as, as when you first had Isaiah to say them. May we have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that really rejoice at, at your good news. And may we believe it's not just history, but may we believe it's for us today. And may we, like you overflowed and, and chose to create us with your love, may we in our lives overflow and choose to share the goodness that we've experienced with you with others, Lord. May you do that in us and amongst us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So some context on this scripture before we, before we hear the scripture. Uh, some context is it from Isaiah. So the, 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 we've, I think we've got a map that we're going to put on screen. So in, in Isaiah's time, 700 years or so before Jesus, uh, Israel was, the 12 tribes of Israel that we hear about in the Bible are really divided north and south into Israel, 10 tribes up in the north, and then into the southern kingdom, Judah, where, down where Jerusalem is. And so there's 10, king, or 10 tribes up north, two kings down south, and then there's some rough folks in the neighborhood. Anybody had a rough neighbor? Well, the, the people of Israel have had some really rough neighbors, and at this time, there was a really rough neighbor named Assyria, and Assyria was taking captive the northern kingdom. Now, we, we know from the ancient scriptures that the northern kingdom must have been disobedient, and there was reasons that they were um, getting punished and things. But So the ten tribes of, of the northern part, of, which was called Israel, are taken captive by Assyria, and then those become the lost tribes of Israel, if you've ever heard that phrase, the ten lost tribes. And they're never really organized completely again. Right, you hear of people from those tribes in the scriptures, but but they're never really a nation again. And this is around in the 700s. And so th this is a nerve-wracking time if you're if you're like Isaiah, you're working for God uh, in the southern part of the kingdom, and you're hearing about uh, bad things happening up in the, in the north. Now, the the north, the the folks in in the ten tribes up there, they had not necessarily been nice to the folks of Judah. There had been you could say civil war between the tribes, uh, the Jewish tribes. There'd been difficulties. They're, they each had different kings, and uh, so there'd been pain and loss between them. So this was a, a difficult time where not all of God's people were being faithful. And part of, part of Isaiah's ministry in the southern kingdom was to say, hey, we need to be obedient to God and follow him, or the, the fate that happened to, the, to our brothers and sisters up north could happen to us. Assyria could come and capture us or destroy us. And so there's all kinds of challenges or issues going on. Will we have faith in God despite the difficulties in the world around us? Will we be obedient to God despite uh, Assyria coming in with their religion and their demands? Will we choose to be obedient to God no matter what? Will we cave in to fear, right? Will we just surrender? That was, that was one of the northern strategies that ended up not even working out, obviously. Uh, are we going to cave in, right? And so lots of issues today, you know, we still have some of those issues, right? Will we trust God in the midst of difficult circumstances? Will we obey when there's temptations from the outside to not? Will we, will we live lives of fear or lives of faith? Will we surrender or cave in to the world around us? Or will we, will we, with God's leadership and help, stay faithful and true? So all those issues are real and present in, in the time that Isaiah is serving as a preacher or a prophet. So tension and decisions uh, that people are being tempted with, will we stay true to the God who has led us? Um, so, with all of that as background, we're going to dive into the scripture, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. So did you hear the promises of in dark times, God is going to bring salvation, bring a saving leader that is going to come in and lead his people in a difficult time and bring his joy in the midst of it. So there were these deep promises uh, given that God gave through the prophet Isaiah, and they really mattered. So I want to talk about these these promises and what, what they would have been hearing at the time. If we re- rewind back 2,700 years. Well, e- even before Isaiah's time, if we go back all the way to the book of Genesis, there had been a man named Abraham, right? And God had given promises to his people, starting with Abraham and then Abraham's line. He had promised that Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore. And and Abraham didn't even have a kid when God gave him those promises and didn't for many decades. But God said to Abraham, you are going to have nations come from you. And and out of you is going to come a nation that will be a blessing to all the nations. And so he gave those promises to Abraham and that there'd be this kingdom that would be a light to all the world. And then God did that. He formed the the Hebrew people into uh, a kingdom, a kingdom called Israel. We fast forward to that time where where God formed a kingdom that was different or set apart in the world. They they worshiped one God, and they were trying to be a blessing to all the nations, but they struggled because they're human beings, right? But they they had a good king uh, about 300 years before uh, the time of Isaiah or or a thousand years before Jesus, but this king named David. And David united the tribes of Israel and he, he founded um, the capital city of Jerusalem or founded Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel. And in his reign of 40 years, it was, it, it was a good and faithful kingdom, right? And, and people were meeting, worshiping God, and they were starting to be a blessing to the nations around them, right? And, and at the end of David's life or near the end of his life, he received promises that a king would come from his line. You can read about this in 2 Samuel 7, but David, this good king after uh, uh, after God's own heart, received promises that from his line would come a king that would reign forever, right? And and so these promises that David heard were then passed down to the the Jewish people, and they believed them. They were recorded in their history and and passed down. But you go from David then back to Isaiah 300 years later, People like Isaiah knew that that promise had not yet been fulfilled. That at Isaiah's time, the kingdom wasn't even united anymore, right? And they definitely hadn't received a king that was going to reign forever, but they still believed the promises. And so why they mattered is they had hope that God wouldn't have said those words to to David if they weren't going to come true, right? So God said that we would have a kingdom forever. God said that the, the children of Abraham would be a blessing to all nations. God keeps his promises And so they were people believing the promises and passing them down. And so in Isaiah's time, they heard through Isaiah even more promises, right? Isaiah receives this, he prays and he he receives this message from God that in these tough times, these tough times, moving to the next slide, these tough times, they are hearing ongoing promises that, yeah, God is going to keep his promises, right? So we have tough times. That doesn't mean God's given up or his word has changed. It says he's going to send a light in in this time of deep darkness. There is a light in dark times. So Isaiah's message for that time from God is though though Judah has fallen and, and though we have the same fear of this rough neighbor coming in, Assyria, we should trust that God has a joyful plan for us. Just like joy that will come when we have a really good harvest, he says. Or the joy that comes after you have a victory over an enemy and you get to divide up their spoils or the spoils of of victory. We're going to have victory. We're going to have a joyful harvest. And and what that means is God is saying to, to and through Isaiah that one day I'm going to break the control of the powers that are trying to have you live in fear. I'm going to take the burdensome yoke that, that gets put on you in this world 
and I'm going to break it, like a yoke that's on the back of an oxen or a yoke that even went on human beings sometimes to, to do work. Yeah, he's saying, I'm going to take those, those burdensome yokes of the world, and I'm going to break them. I'm going to take the staff and the rod that, that enemies use to keep you in control, uh, controlling measures of the world and, 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 and things that are used for violence, and I'm going to break them. I'm going to take the, the boots and the garments that have been used and dirtied in war, even with blood, and I'm going to burn them. And so Isaiah is getting a picture of, of God is going to come in and break the things that cause us to live in fear and shame and, and, and take the things that are, that are the, the world's injustice and violence and the conflict and the war. And God is going to end this, right? He's going to end this. But how? Right? In this world of darkness with all these strong uh, world powers like Assyria at the time. Well, his, leader, his answer is a leader, and it's kind of surprising. He says, a child. Right? Let's hear that answer again. Of the one who's going to break all those things. He said, to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I believe in faith that this isn't describing a human king, that no human king could handle those titles, right? This is describing a divine king. And then it says, verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of, Dav of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The Spirit is telling Isaiah, reclaim that promise that a king, a ruler, is coming from David's line that's going to reign forever. Not just a good king that's going to be in office for a few years or even 40 years, but something that only the zeal of the Lord could do. A ruler that's going to bring in his peace forever. Right? So this is, this is as they hear this, you know, I, how much of this they can receive at that time? I think they're receiving a lot of hope, like, well, God's going to send a really good leader, right? And so at their time, I think they were probably thinking, God's, the next king God is going to send is going to be really good. <laughs> and you know what? The next king for Judah was really good. His name was Hezekiah, and he, he returned the people back to faithfulness, and he did bring a lot of protection, and he was good. But he wasn't mighty God, <laughs> right? He wasn't God himself. He did worship God, but he was a human being. He wasn't perfect. And so after Isaiah is dead and gone and Hezekiah is dead and gone and history keeps moving along, these promises of Isaiah, they keep hearing them and believing them and they keep saying, you know what? That wasn't just about Hezekiah. That was about something way bigger. And in the Jewish thinking, it came to be called the Messiah, the promised one, the one who is to come. And so, you know, these promises come and they, they say, wait, maybe God's plan is he's going to send really a forever king. And so the Jewish people over the centuries kept praying for the Messiah to come, the Savior, the Chosen One, the true rescuer. And then enter in Jesus 700 years after Isaiah, right? That there were Jewish people and when, that, that were choosing to follow Jesus. One of the first scriptures Jesus read in public was from the book of Isaiah, right? And he basically tell them, this, it's now unfolding in your presence, right? And, and so Jesus comes and he, he lives this, this wonderful, perfect life, and then he dies a sinner's death on the cross, though he wasn't a sinner. And then he rises again, and hundreds of people saw him after he was dead. And, and then, so he has these believers, these first followers, and they look at him and they go, here it is. He's the one. He fulfills all those promises that we've been praying about. And he's not just a man, though we know where his mother lives. He's something more than that. Maybe the stories about his birth are true. Maybe that's how we fulfill Isaiah 9. Maybe he is exactly mighty God. Maybe he's connected to the everlasting father. Maybe, maybe he is truly the, the prince of peace. And so the early followers of Jesus, they, they preached and shared scriptures like this to their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters saying, he has come. The light has come into our darkness. It was Jesus himself. And so these promises matter because they came true. And so we are in continuation. If you believe in Jesus we are in a continuation of those first believers believing that God's salvation plan, the true light, has come into the world. And so we are living in these promises. We're not just celebrating them for a holiday once a year. We are living in the promises. So that's our next thought. We just want to have up there just living in the promises. 
that these are not just religious ideas. This is about living in the promises that God has given in the past but made fully true. When God gives promises in his word, we have a choice whether we will believe them or not. Not just believe them with your head, but trust them with all that we are. Like, is there a God who is so good that he would come into broken humanity and choose to mend the the things that are broken about us, choose to destroy the the burdensome yokes and the the rods and the staffs that are of violence and evil, choose to one day end war and oppression? Do we have a God that good that would come into our messy world filled with wars and brokenness? And our answer is yes, we do. We have that God because we have seen his first coming. Jesus Christ came into the world. And so we trust that and we live in this promise. We live in the light uh, uh, that God has revealed. God has promised a saving leader. And and we do not cave into the the idea that, well, there's still wars, there's still brokenness. So he didn't do very much. No, we don't, just like Isaiah didn't cave in and not have hope in his time. He heard the promises and he passed them on. We believe our promises and we pass them on. We believe that God is going to come again and make all things right. He's already ushered in his kingdom. He is the king. He has broken the power of sin, death, and evil. And one day, all of that stuff is gonna be completely gone. Fuel for the fire. So for the follower of Jesus, we believe God has come and we have to, we have to cling true or cling always to that promise and its truth. The kingdom is real. We don't need to establish it. It's breaking into the world. We need to trust it. We need to trust that we are a part of his kingdom. It is already here. The eternal kingdom of God is already here. And one day, the next advent, it will be fully complete, right? And our faith will be sight, and our hopes will be fulfilled, and joy will fill our hearts. Now, in the meantime, We live in a bloodied, broken, and burned up world. That's what's next, right? We live in a bloodied, broken, and burned world. And so this prophecy has some uh, some very visual symbols of our our world, right? It doesn't take long to just tune on the news. I I did it as an experiment this morning. I don't usually listen to the news in the morning, but I, I listened to the news for just two minutes before I heard about a war. That, the, that Syria is you know, deep in war. We forget that Syria is still fighting, but Syria, the same area, right? Still fighting and follow, the, the battle of, for the city of Aleppo still rages on. And real people are dying. Boots and garments getting bloodied and muddied in war. And that's not the only place, right? And God is a God who sees those who are suffering sees those who are being held down in in, in, child trafficking or other things with oppression, the yokes that are being put on people. And God is still the God who has given these promises and said, I am going to take those garments rolled in blood, those boots muddied in the battle, the yoke of, of oppression that's still in this world, the rod and the staff of the earthly powers that try to control and abuse and hurt people, I am I am going to fully get rid of them one day. And so the Advent season for us is to have hope in the midst of the world that still has very difficult realities. We don't stick our head in the sand. We don't deny them. We are the people who want to, in the meantime, usher in more and more of his heavenly kingdom on earth however we can, right, while having hope that one day he will completely resolve all the issues. So we want to be people who are undoing the blood and the brokenness and, the, and, and the, the, that stuff now, the, the abuse, the, the unhealthy control, the slavery in the world, the hatred that's in our stories and our world now. We, we are not just waiting for Jesus to come back to do something about it. We are part of the kingdom that he has put on earth now that is advancing, waiting for him to come back expectantly, but we're doing whatever we can do about it in our families, in our communities, right? By shining his light here and now. Because we believe in a God who came to us in the midst of our brokenness, right? This is really good news. Christmas is not just a sentimental holiday. Christmas is a holiday that says, "Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh, I am not gonna take the darkness anymore. Christmas is a defiance from God. Christmas is a stand by God 
to bring light into a dark world and say, as he says in his world, the darkness will not overcome my light. Do we believe that? And do you have that hope in your heart? That do you have joy that the light has come? Because how you face those brokenness in the world, the brokenness of the world is with the power of joy. The scriptures say the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? That's our strength. To face the difficulties of this world, we have, we have to have the joy of who Jesus is and what he's done. We have the joy that there is, there's a harvest that we get to see, a harvest that we'll get to fully understand in heaven, but we get to see lives change now. We get to see relationships restored. We get to see people coming back to faith and overcoming addiction. We get to see the joy of the harvest now, then one day we're gonna fully see it, but we get to start to see it now. We get to have the spoils of victory now right? We get to have the joy of that now. We get to believe that God is is helping us to be new in his kingdom now, and one day it will be forevermore. So I I, I pray for everyone who's listening to this message in this room or in the future that, that everyone has had the joy of the victory of the Lord of Jesus in their life, but there's no way for me to know if everybody's had that yet. So I just want to ask the question, do you have the joy of the victory of the love of Jesus in your life? Is your life filled with overflowing of the joy that God loves us so much that he has come into this world to rescue us uh, from the darkness, to break these things that bind us? Do you have that joy overflowing? Now, there's kind of two options if you're not, it's, we're not just talking about an emotion here, we're talking about that central character trait of God becoming a central character trait in you, joy. Now, if you, you aren't experiencing that in your life, there's kind of two basic options. One, you've never, you've never really received relationship with him. Or two, you have received relationship with him, but your, your Assyria or your challenges or your fear is kind of clouding over that joy. So I want to say, I want to speak to both of those briefly as we just wrap up and say, the light has come. If you don't believe in him yet, I want you to believe that the story is not too good to be true. It is the the true good story that that life exists because a joyful God wanted it to exist. A joyful God wants you to exist. A joyful God came down in the midst of our darkness and died on a cross for us knowing that it was going to happen so that he could forgive you and wash you and make you new and clean and make you able to live with him forever. It is that good. He wants that joyful story in your heart. If you haven't believed and trusted that story before and lived in that promise, do it today and you can do it just by simply saying Lord Jesus I believe I believe in you I trust you and your story and just by believing that in your heart and confessing that out loud to some believer today you you are welcomed into his family now and forevermore and then for someone who's saying well this joy stuff is good and I've had the the joy before but I don't really have it now we can pray like David prayed elsewhere May, the, may you return to me the joy of my salvation. Lord, the, the, the cloudiness and the darkness and the heaviness of this world sometimes tries to push down the joy of how good you are and what you've done. But Lord, may the joy of your salvation return to my heart. I just, if you, I just believe if you pray that with sincerity, God will give you back the experience of that and he will let, he will let that light shine and overcome any darkness that's trying to dampen your joy parade in your life. Lord God, you, you are the God who is the God of joy. And you wanted us to experience the joy of your goodness, of relationship with you. But to do that, you had to endure the cross and despise the shame of it. But for the joy set before you, that's exactly what you did. So I pray, Lord, for all those who are hearing this message, hearing the words of Isaiah, that that they would believe that these promises are still true and fulfilled in Jesus. That that he is the one that, that burns up all the broken stuff of this world. And he is the one that that brings us the ultimate joy. He is the one born as a child, but became a king. The true king. Help us to believe and live in these promises today and forevermore. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.